I always knew I was going to go into like these adventures. Like I like I don't make any income. In fact, I give most of my savings into them. But that's not the point. I I just have to do them. You know, they're inside me. It's it's just listening to that um, internal compass. And I've learned to value those feelings and that trust, or I've learned to um, trust it through a lot of trial and error and analysis. And um, I feel I have a really strong relationship with that kind of, uh, if you want to call it internal compass or gut instinct or intuition or whatever. Uh, and that I just couldn't do anything else. I wouldn't be able to get up in the morning and look myself directly in the in the mirror, you know, and, and be happy. So um, if some, good comes of this if I can find some way um, of uh, making an income of it or whatever great but if not I don't really care man I'm just I'm very happy doing this you know the um, sweetest hour was day 17 the steering broke um, and it was how I reacted so the steering um, on an ocean rowing boat, you can do two different methods. You can go with foot steering, which is a real basic way to go across. It means basically your foot is attached to a couple of lines that are attached to the rudder and they, that's how you steer. Uh, or you can go auto, with an auto helm, which is a machine that you put in the, in the back of the boat that's attached to the rudder and you don't have to worry about your steering. It steers itself, basically. So you won't be surprised to know I went foot steering, kind of the hardest way you can do it. Um, that broke on day 17. So what was an uh, incredibly diff difficult endeavor just became 10 times more difficult because um, steering a boat, with this, uh, when the steering breaks, you have to steer with the oars and steering a boat with the oars is very, very physically demanding. Um, so uh, I, I think one of my great strengths is I process things really quickly and come back to what I can control. So when I realized that happened, I knew what I had to do, but I didn't dwell on it. I didn't feel sorry for myself. I literally, you know, over the course of maybe a couple of minutes realized like that, well, listen, I've still got a boat that floats. I've still got a seat and I've still got two oars. I can still get there. And just that, I remember that like time just that reaction was kind of, um, yeah, it just stands out to me so much because um, everything inside you and everything is, everything inside you is kind of go the other way, you know, feel sorry for yourself. But um, I think it's just down to been in that situation lots, well, not to such gravity, but it been in that situation and just having those processes is kind of almost like second nature now that, you know, got to, got to, control what you can control and I could still get there so I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna kind of wallow in self-pity you know which which would have been the easy thing to do. Uh, I'm from Galway City um, I'm from Renmore in Galway City so it's just uh, just down from Galwegians Rugby Club. I think it was an evolution you know I think it was just uh, learning as I went and and true rugby um, you know seeing the power of um, you know improving physically and it, it almost becomes addictive you know because um well you see where it brings you you know it brings you a step further or a step closer or it deepens you a little bit you know to um deepens your character a little bit whatever so um you know that that really appeals to me you know i i think i um i integrated a, a side of kind of self improvement at a very young age you know when i was kind of in fifth year in the bish like i didn't even make my senior rugby team like you know um, and I remember just, I just wasn't, I was completely unfit and I just remember kind of making a choice to change that, you know, and start going to the gym at lunchtime instead of going up town and going up to Goegians and running laps at 11 o'clock at night, you know, and I, that kind of, you know, the improvement I got from that, those actions, um, were very clear to me that, you know, you've put in the work, then you'll get the rewards, you know, and that, you know, like I said, it was almost like a, a drug after that, you know, the more I pushed myself or the more training I did, um, uh, the, the better it seemed to, the better I seemed to get it, whatever the goal was. Like when you're getting into um, uh, states of suffering that, you know, you just don't get into unless you push yourself in there or you find yourself there accidentally, you know. Um, and um, it's how you react to that suffering, really, you know, so are those hardships or whatever they may be. And I, I choose or I just find that I always seem to uh, relish those moments and I seem to grow. I seem to become a person I love to be when I'm in those moments. And, and uh, it gives me a lot of um, strength and confidence just seeing that side of me. And uh, unless you push yourself in there and unless you go there quite regularly, um, you don't really, um, don't really understand it or um, 
you know, you don't really get the benefits of it. So uh, I like to do it in my training also. So I like to really push myself in my training um, and uh, and and get the get into those windows that gives you a lot of perspective and clarity and um, and kind of uh, um, yeah in your life. You know, yeah. Lucky enough, obviously, rugby was quite a. Um, you know, newly professional at that stage, and I was lucky enough to get a um, a contract that in in the ninety nine two thousand season. You know, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, it's not like now there wasn't a lot of depth in these rosters of rugby players. You know, there's no academy systems or that. So uh, I just was a big old lump, and I suppose they, I kind of got uh, very luckily got fast tracked into the into the Connacht senior squad, and uh, yeah, I played there for uh, four years, and then moved on to Northampton. Um, uh, for four years after that and the journey continued to France and back to Ireland with Leinster and finished up in France um, f um, kind of 15 years uh, career. The first six months at Leinster was uh, bizarre. Um, I felt like I have it's so strange because I'm Irish obviously I know the culture but I felt out of my culture you know, because three years in France, completely different, very lackadaisical kind of attitudes. And I was living out in the middle of nowhere in the country. And I just got thrown into this uh, environment that was, you know, night and day compared to the training I'd gone through. And it was just trying to f trying to find my feet again um, with a lot of demands pushed on me. And I didn't feel I was fit. And I didn't feel um, I didn't feel comfortable in the city either, particularly if I'm being honest. So, um, not in a city, not the city. So, um, yeah, it took me a long time to kind of get my head around that, and felt I started playing a bit better. I had a couple of decent games in the Heineken Cup, but I wasn't happy with my form. I would say I had like four good games in about twenty-two or three, whatever I played that year. As you kind of progress through the years, and as you have to survive in that environment, you and as you push yourself more into it, you kind of see it for what it is. You know, you, you, it's not, it doesn't become, or it doesn't have the same level of importance. The more you've invested in it, the more you've kind of um, thrown yourself into it and absolutely 100% committed. Um, you, yeah, you just seem to um, have a better perspective of what rugby is in the bigger scheme of things, you know. So I would definitely have been a, you know, if, if Twitter was around when I was 24, I would definitely have been a professional rugby player in my bio, you know. But uh, I'm not an ex-professional rugby player in my Twitter bio now, you know, because you, I feel like you have to cut all, I'm sorry, I had to cut all ties with the game, you know. I just, I, I couldn't hang on tent and I don't want to play a, a friendly game I don't want to play a charity game I'm not interested like I just I needed that break from the environment um, because I felt like I I'd kind of I'd fallen out a little bit of not lo no I was just a little bit disillusioned at the end you know and I I, I, I felt like I'd just given everything of myself to it and it was time to just do something completely different and cut all ties for a little while. I'm not saying forever, I still love the game and I'd love to do some coaching in the future, but um, you know, if those first two years were, um, there was no question that I was going to do anything involved in rugby, you know. Like I, I felt I had, had given everything to rugby that I could, I had no regrets, and um, I was excited about trying other stuff that I'd kind of um, developed an affinity and a passion for as I went along, you know, so I had these things in mind. I literally had a list of stuff that I wanted. I had written down a list of stuff that I wanted to uh, go and, and take on, uh, like, and try and achieve, you know. So, um, I, the, I, ideally, I would have finished playing, you know, but I, I didn't have that option. So some of these challenges had to be just put back a little bit till, till I got my knee correct, you know. But um, when that came good, you know, I, I um, yeah, I was really excited to kind of take on, um, you know, the the adventures that I'd learned about over the years of rugby. When I was at Saints, we used to do a lot of erg work, um, the indoor roar, you know, um, just especially the bigger guys for off-feet conditioning. So I always had a inkling that I was pretty good at it. There was a guy at Saints called Luke Harbert who did a lot of rowing in his youth, and he said, geez, your times are pretty good, you know. And uh, so I, I kind of always like, what would you say, 
venture towards that rather than a treadmill or rather than a watt bike or well there was no watt bikes back then but a, a bike or whatever so um yeah i did a lot of work and built up a lot of volume and i could see obviously my time's coming down and uh built up this love hate relationship with it so i think it was johnny claxton who uh, was an snc guy from new zealand who came into um leinster brought in this rowing golf and it was it was um, an optional session that he put on the wall. Uh, my, that was my second year when I was injured. So when I actually had um, facilities to, uh, physical facilities to actually get back rowing, because I didn't put, my, it, my shoulder could row. Uh, I just couldn't, um, pushing was the real problem with it, you know. So uh, yeah, I just started doing it. And then uh, myself and Tom Denton had a little bit of a, a kind of, records you know breaking each other's records for a little while and then just one day i just <laughs> pushed by him a little bit and got the i think it's um the score is called 18 under basically you know so um and i believe it still stands even though i've beaten it since that on my own <laughs> i kind of another one of those bucket list things that i had down was to compete in the irish indoor Ch rowing championships to kind of see where i was at you know so i went down a couple of years ago just before the Mountain de Sable, because I would have used a lot of uh, erg work in that to, to get fit. And um, I came like, I think it was fifth in the 2000 meters. It was against all the guys who were like um, hopeful Olympians. And I won the 500, uh, the shorter, power, more power kind of base distance, you know. So uh, I was pretty happy with that. Uh, broke the Irish record actually as well. And then went down again just before the row, because obviously there was a lot of rowing in my training. And uh, yeah, I broke my old record for the 500 and um, broke the 1,000 meter record, the Irish record as well. So yeah, I just have, um, I just have a love-hate relationship with the machine. It's just like, it's, it's suffering. It's suffering, you know, a 2K, a 2K time trial on an ergometer looks into your soul. Like, I mean, it is, if you want to see what you're made of, you go as fast as you can for six and a half minutes on an erg or six minutes and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll know exactly who you are at the end of that. Day one was, like I've said it a few times, just such an absolute nightmare. Um, some of it was down to my own doing and some of it wasn't. So basically what happened on day one is obviously it's this huge emotional peak. You know, you say goodbye to your parents and also there's the... the um, the realization of something happening that you've kind of poured yourself into over 18 months and it's taken over. So that's, you know, I remember just pulling away from uh, La Gamera or pulling out the marina and like one minute I'd be hooping and hollering and just like, I mean, just on the highest buzz ever. And the next minute I'd be crying. Like I just, I couldn't explain it, like why it was going like that. But yeah, I think it was, there were tears of joy, I think. But uh, yeah, like I said, it was just this crazy roller coaster. So you have all that that comes into play. And then things started going wrong after about six hours or seven hours rowing. So um, my heels started to blister up. Um, all these calluses on my hands tore off. And then I had this extreme cramping in uh, my lower limbs, like the major muscle groups, quads, hammies, calves, like cramping like I've never had in my life. And uh, I've done quite a lot of physical stuff. So, you know, when you're rock, the thing you can rely on in any situation is shook. I, I, I was just like, I was like, what is going on? How can this be happening? You know, this is such an important thing. And yeah, you know, you have to remember it's a race as well. So I was kind of feeling like I was like losing ground in the race. And then um, then I, I took the decision to kind of put my head down for an hour and try and get some water into me. Um, sorry, because I was seasick as well, of course, you know, so puking constantly. And then I, I just, I needed an hour's rest to give my body some sort of chance to recover. So I, I put the head down for an hour. I got up and I'd been blown back a mile. The weather had shifted and we were getting headwinds. So um, that mile, it took me another three hours of rowing to get back to the point on the GPS. I remember it correctly. It was, I remember it exactly. It was 42.2 kilometers. Um, so I, my decision then, or sorry, my plan was then, to, okay, like it's it's midnight now or one o'clock. So I'll put out a, a thing called a power anchor, which is a, it's an anchor that you use in, um, uh, when you can't use a ground anchor when the sea is too deep. So it's just like a parachute that sits in the water, uh, holds about two tons of water in it and it stops you getting blown back. So so I did that um, and there's a lot of faff involved in that. You know, you have a lot of rope, you have 90 meters of rope and then 115 meters of retrieval line. So it takes a while. So I did that, finally got into a bed, uh, woke up five hours later, like five, six in the morning and saw I'd been blown back a mile and a half. And that's not meant to happen. So with all the physical issues that were going on and now this 
um, I was like, I was like, what the fuck? Like that was the first time I remember pulling in the rope, still pitch black, pulling in the retrieval rope, rope, and the conditions were big enough. I was getting hit in the face. The waves just going, you know, if, oh, what's going on? Like if this continues, I, you know, I mightn't. If this continues for three or four days, I don't know if I have the capacity to to get out of here. You know, um, so I was frustrated, a little bit disappointed, angry, pissed off for all those reasons. So. I, again, I just decided just to go to work, know what I, or sorry, control what I can control and do what I know. So I just hopped on the oars and I rowed for seven hours straight and rowed till one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I hardly got anywhere. I only got four miles, like normally you'd be a, should be getting way, way more. But um, two other boats were in the exact same situation as me and they didn't row for seven hours. And one of us got away and the other two didn't and they had to be pulled in after uh, three days of trying to get away from those conditions that localized low pressure so um yeah retrospectively obviously i look back and i go that that moment or you know saved my race but i mean the whole run-up to it man i i you know i was completely in like a very negative space and yeah i was completely rocked shook i suppose is the best way to describe it no, and I have actually have. I brought. Um, <laughs> you like this one? I brought. Uh, like I must have paid about four hundred euro in audiobooks like about a week before I left, and uh, I had never used them in my training. But and there's a speaker system either side of the rowing position. But uh, on day four, when I put um, when I put my first audiobook on, I realized I couldn't hear the voices over the wind. So one of those books was Shackleton's Endurance. So it's still sitting on my phone here, waiting to be listened to. <laughs> I think. Uh, you know, life is, um, well, I look at, like, I, I look, I kind of reverse engineer life a lot. You know, I, I've i written an epitaph of myself and what people want to say about me. And I, I work back from that. You know, what are people going to say on when you're in the coffin and they're talking about you, you know? And I use those motivations to drive me into my honest, kind of sincere endeavors. And, and, and these are them, and, and that's why I do them. And, and you know, um, I find the, the motivation very easy with, with kind of, with, kind of framing things like that, you know. Even as I was crossing, I was thinking about what was next, you know. Um, well, you have a lot of time to think anyway. So uh, there's there's a few adventures that are, well, there's ones written down, of course, and the, the Seven Summits is one that really appeals to me. I, I love mountains. I love the challenge of mountains. You know, the, the lack of oxygen brings a different element to challenges, you know, just because it, it becomes almost meditative. You know, you, you have to control your breathing to such a level that you, you can hardly concentrate on anything else. Just you basically have 5% concentration on putting one foot in front of the other and 95% on using the, the little amount of oxygen that's in the air, you know. So I've had... Um, I, had, I struggled up Kilimanjaro one off-season, actually, between, um, I think it was Leinster and Oyana. Um, and uh, yeah, just I, I, it was one of those really rewarding experiences that like uh, you just kind of it grows in you as time goes by, you know. So um, I've done a little bit since then, but um, you know I've done Mont Blanc and a little bit and stuff in Afghanistan at high altitude, but nothing like uh, you know the seven summits will entail, you know. But uh, I think that's something I'll definitely do. Um, on, uh, for numerous le for numerous reasons, um, for the fact that it's you know seven corners of the world that I've well six corners of the world that I haven't been in, and um, just for the adventure of it, and of course the challenge, and I think it'd be something pretty incredible to to have done as well. That's where the drive comes from. That's where you, you don't see it any clearer than in a really tough match, like you know where. You know, you're you're almost in a, a flow state. You know, a, a game where you just you're just loving it, like you're just like everything is going your way, you're almost in a flow state, you're making those hits and you're suffering and you're dragging guys with you and you just feel so powerful, you know, when you when you get into that state. Um, I try and, uh, well, that's a big hole when you leave rugby, so you need to fill it somehow. And I find the true adventures that I can fill it from time to time, you know, when I really do push myself into those places and, uh, um, and kind of delve into that kind of savage warrior part, you know, that doesn't come out. It's very hard to get it out just walking down the street there in, in Dublin or Galway, like, you know, without getting arrested anyway. <laughs>